I do apologize for the technical issues. So we will start with the presentation. Um, Okay, I do apologize for this inconvenience. I will start sharing now uh, the presentation. This is the word of Zoom and technical <laughs> issues happening. Okay, so let us start by introducing the target plan concept and ecological restoration. We will start with a small definition of the target plan concept, how it relates to the production of native seedlings and sharing some case studies uh, from different parts of the world. I, I wanted to start with the representation of the MENA region, just to show the scale that we're working on um, on ecological restoration. And moreover that there are different definitions where some of the definitions add uh, other countries and it depends on which definition we're following. But this is not now the, our case. Uh, it was just to share with you um, the limits that we are working on and to introduce the different climates also within the MENA region that uh, is distinguished by tropical, dry, semi-arid, mid-altitude climates and highland. And you, as you can see here on this map, most of it is, con is in the dry, arid and semi-arid climates, which is um, an important issue for us with climate change, the water available by 2025 will be decreased drastically in most of that region. So this is where rest ecological restoration is so important if we do consider uh, the scarcity of water within the region. Traditionally, we would, if we had any project, we know that there would be needs of seedlings, the nursery would grow the seedlings and the seedlings would be planted, or nurseries would be growing seedlings not knowing um, where they will end up, then there will be the need for seedlings and seedlings will be planted. All of this is done in a very traditional way without taking into consideration um, the soil depth, the limiting factor on the site, such as soil depth, climate, the people working on the project, the species genetics and also not taking into consideration if these will be monitored and what will be the exact long-term impact of planting native seedlings. We have very diverse local and regional conditions. For instance, in a tiny country like in Lebanon, we have identified 13 regions of provenances. As a region of provenance, a provenance is a region that have similar ecological conditions. We have 13 different in such a tiny country and in most of the MENA region countries, we have simil similar also uh, divisions of regions of provenances. They differ in adaptation between and within the same species. 
So even within the same species, we have differences in adaptation in different regions of provinces. This is where the target plan concept comes. The target plan concept in a very easy way, we are customizing a plant material, let it be a seedling, seeds, to an actual objective, to an actual site that will ensure higher survival rate. We will go into it in the next few slides, but the target plant concept mainly focuses on six different components. The first one is, is actually identifying the objectives of any project. And this is the main one before starting. The second one would be to identify the right type of plant material. Then the source of seed or the cutting, the limiting factors on our site. If we want to plant in any site, we need to identify what are the limiting factors, the, the timing of the outplanting window, and the type of outplanting tools. So technically, we are targeting specific physiological and morphological characteristics that can be quantitatively linked with our planting success. The design nursery practices, they have to meet the limiting factors on the uh, project site, such as the soil depth, the rooting profile, the seed sources and genetics, seedling quality, and the planting season and handling. So whenever we think of producing the best plant material, we have to think on the long term, how will this seedling or seed establish on the outplanting site? And how will this contribute to ecological restoration? Planting trees or shrubs is part, is, is one activity in ecological restoration. And we need to think that it's not only about improving green spaces and increasing green spaces, but it's about restoring some of the important ecological functions in any ecosystem. So why, does, uh, why do we need to focus on native seedling production? Knowing that we have different site conditions, even within our same project site, we have different site conditions from different soil depth, soil textures, topography, sun exposure, and salinity, pH, very, very diverse site conditions that could exist within the same project site. So any kind of reforestation or restoration success will depend on three major parts. The native nurseries, the field, the field conditions, and of course, our communities. So technically today we are focusing more on native nurseries and seedling production and the target plan concept. Nursery culturing practices, they dictate the, the seedling quality and that will eventually influence the survival rate post planting. First of all, we need to be able to define our, um, our objectives. It's not only about planting trees or shrubs on the ground. This is not the only objective that we have. Our objective is also could be ecological, could be social, cultural, or, or economic. Um, examples of ecological um, objectives could be to prevent soil erosion, watershed protection, wildlife conservation, endangered species conservation. Social or culture could be ecotourism or conservation of some historical sites. Economic to, uh, can be for timber production, non-wood forest products, and diversify income generating activities such as agroforestry. So the important thing is before starting to identify what are the best nursery practices and seedling production, we need to identify the project objectives that we just stated now. 
And we need also to identify our site limiting factors from topography, soil, anthropogenic, and climate limiting factors. Then we are able to develop and select the best nursery practices and develop our objectives at the, at the nursery level. So the objective of, of selecting the best nursery practices is to strengthen the production of vigorous tree seedlings by native tree nurseries and increasing seedling survivorship and thus reforestation success. So how do, we, how do we continue with assessing and identifying the next steps for nursery practices? We will talk about four different areas. First one is the selection of suitable native species and plant material. The second one is to determine the best outplanting time. The third one is to determine the seed handling and treatment. And the fourth one, is to determine the species stock type, which we will be talking in a few next slide in the few next slides. Selecting first suitable plant species and plant material is based on local knowledge, on site assessment, and on mapping. If we can have the three of them this would be the perfect way to select species and plant material. If not, it could be based on one or two of, um, of those, either local knowledge and site assessment sometimes on their own or mapping and site assessment. So depending on the objectives of our project, we can then, it will help us in selecting the best species. What is the, the, the objective of, of our project? For instance, if the objective of our project is to, it's for wildlife conservation. So we need to keep in mind to select species that are consumed or used by wildlife species and select species for wildlife habitat conservation. If it's restoration of some ecological functions, we need to first identify what are those ecological functions we would like to restore in our project and select the species to support the restoration of those selected functions. It could be that our objective is flora genetic adaptation studies for climate change. And here in that case, we select the species in question for the genetic study. And uh, a last objective could be livelihood improvement, where we select species to support income generating activities for local communities. Um, so what is the best type of plant material to use? The plant material type could be different from seeds to cuttings, bare wood seedlings, container seedlings, most of the species and most of the projects, they use container uh, seedlings and rootstocks. The selection is based on different criteria and different factors. It could be precipitation level, the soil moisture, the topography, anthropogenic stresses, resources, etc. So depending on, um, on those criteria, we can then select the most proper plant material. The second one is to determine the best outplanting time. Once we select the best outplanting time, we can then identify the best sowing time for the, uh, at the nursery. So as we know that the, the um, outplanting time is based on rainfall and avoiding frost, and taking into consideration the species characteristics, which is growth habit, if they're fast growing, slow growing, and the seed treatment and germination needs of that species, we can then identify what is the best sowing time at the nursery. Selecting the best sowing time will also allow to decrease cost of production for seedlings and also be able to manage um, restoration reforestation projects more easily. 
For instance, in Morocco, the best outplanting time would start in November, where we have the highest precipitation levels. Then we could uh, continue with determining seed handling and treatment. There are some questions that we can, um, we can ask before. Are species identified? If yes, was the sowing time identified? Yes. Do seeds need treatment? Yes or no? If yes, we identify the best seed treatment. Then identify time needed for each treatment before the sowing. I will give one example um, in the below table, which is for the AB species. Usually they would need at least two months of cold certification. And um, the best time for sowing would be in February, taking into consideration that germination will happen soon after. So the best start date for seed treatment is two months before the sow identified sowing time, which would be December. So this is the importance of good planning in nursery in any project. Previous restoration activities, they use the one size fits all, which is using whatever is available as plant material, even if it's one type of plant material, and apply it for all types of conditions and different types of conditions, no, not taking into consideration um, soil depth, soil texture, topography, sun exposure, and the different site conditions. This is where we have to identify the best stock types. What is a stock type? It's a type of nursery stock. And you can see here on the picture on the top right, the different sizes and every size we call it a stock type. The different sizes and different types of the different stock types are used in different site conditions and different projects. The proper selection of stock type can help overcome limiting, limiting factors on planting sites. For instance, and the stock type is usually controlled uh, through nursery practices from fertilization programs, irrigation, container type, sowing date, and other weekly or monthly practices. For instance, we will go with um, some examples if we have the species that is identified, we identify the planting site characteristics, such as soil depth and soil texture. We identify and determine the growth habit of a species, if it's a slow growing, medium or fast growing species. And then we can select the best type of containers. Again, here I will use the example of citrus. Citrus has a medium growth rate and medium growth habit. And um, we could have two different types of soils. We could have a deep soil or a medium to shallow soil. If, if the uh, soil is, um, is deep, we can use larger volume containers. If the soil type is a shallow soil type, we use smaller volume containers so, um, so the seedling could adapt and once it is out planted, um, we won't have any mistakes during planting. And it's the same with quirker species that is fast growing. If it's used in deep soil, we recommend larger volume containers. If it's used in medium to shallow soil depth, even if it's a fast growing species, we recommend to use a smaller container volume. So this is regarding the containers. When we talk about fertilization, we have to think of it the same way. Once the species that is identified, we determine also its growth habit, if it's a slow, medium, or fast uh, species, growing species. And then we select a, the proper fertilization program. If it's a fast growing species, we do not want to increase fertilization rates too high and um, having the seedlings to grow too fast and too big 
for a restoration project. If uncertain, we recommend to uh, develop some trials. And as you can see here, in different projects in, from between Guinea and Jordan, we have identified uh, different treatments, different fertilization treatments that were used before being able to select the best fertilization program. This goes along with the same for irrigation. Irrigation is, water is one of the most important in seeding production. It's one of the most uh, important factor that could either make a seedling survive and be of good quality, or it could be the worst enemy of a seedling. We use techniques that can measure when the frequency and the quantity of irrigation needed. We won't go into the details now, but these are all quantitative um, practices for irrigation and fertilization and others that enable us to um, identify the best frequency time and the frequency and the quantity for irrigation. To be able to do this, again, we, speci we specify the species growth habit. We identify at which growth stage it is during the season, if it's the establishment phase, the fast growing phase, the hardening phase. Um, and according to the growth habitat of the uh, the growth habitat of each species, we can group them in zones in the nursery. Um, here you have examples again of how um, uh, a certain irrigation system could be developed. Developing seedling quality monitoring plan is one of the most important things that we can do during the season, because if any mistakes or any um, outplanting failure happen due to seedling quality, we can uh, trace it back from our monitoring plan and the record, record keeping. So monitoring can have a daily or periodically frequency, and it's based on climatic data, irrigation, fertilization, and seedling, uh, seedling growth. So technically, we have different parameters that we need that is shown here on the right that we need to take into consideration while we develop a record keeping plan if it's on a daily or periodically uh, base. And here, these are just some pictures to show that um, how seedling and, and root development is usually monitored during the season. So how do we develop a native nursery production timeline? We take into consideration long-term planning. If it's five years, 15 years, or 25 and plus years. What do we want to achieve in our restoration project in five years, in 15 years, or in 25 and more years? So the planning phase usually takes between 12 to 18 up to 24 months before our planting starts. We need to take into consideration objectives of our planting, identification of planting site, site assessment, identification of native species and of plant material, develop seed treatment plan, develop the irrigation and fertilization plans and select the best stop type or container types. Implementation is um, of the nursery season is eight to 12 months prior to our planting and monitoring will happen throughout that season. I just wanted to show you some of the steps that is taken to be able to develop the best seedling and to identify the best seedling type or plant material type for a certain restoration project. Restoration projects that include so many other activities and we think of ecological functions uh, to restore in, in, such, um, in such projects. So selecting uh, a native species or species or plant material that will allow to restore this ecological function is very important and to ensure the highest survivor rate of that plant material on the long term, over five, 10, 20 years, 100 years to come, is one of a key, um, um, key, key aspect of 
improving or restoring ecological functions. I will just present um, some uh, case studies um, about the target plan concept. There are so many other cases that we can, but because of short of time, and we have two other presenters that will share also their, um, their case studies. I wanted to share with one of my favorite projects um, in the Guinea Conakry, West Africa. And the objective was to, restore, to be able to conserve um, a chimpanzee population in the Bosu area that was separated from the Nimba Mountains, as you can see here, and the population was slowly dying because they could not disperse and be merged with the Nimba Mountains and the chimpanzee populations over there. They are very culturally, historically, and environmentally important species, uh, the West uh, African chimpanzees. And um, in the Bosu area, they were genetically isolated from the Nimba mountain chimpanzees, therefore making their movement and mating impossible for reproduction. So once we were there, we wanted to identify um, the objective of our, of our um, project is to be able to have those chimpanzees from the Bosu area to be able to disperse and be connected again to the main chimpanzee population and the Nimba reserve. So for that, we thought, what are our native species that we want to select? So after discussing with the uh, communities and our local stakeholders, we identified that we needed species that were fast growing species to decrease risk of competition. As you can see in that picture, we have a lot of weeds coming up. So selecting fast growing native species would decrease the competition risk. Species that are consumed by chimpanzees, so they are able to, do, to use those and be able to disperse and feel safe to be, to be able to disperse outside of the Bosu area into the Nimba forest. So, after identifying those objectives, we have identified the best nursery practices to be able to produce the uh, best quality native seedlings. That includes seed treatment and seed germination, as you can see here. And we have identified the outplanting site before and started our work our restoration work. Over uh, from 2019 until now, nursery production has gone larger also. And continuous effort were made to be able to find in 2021 this amazing result where on the corridor, they have noticed that chimpanzees from the Bosu area we're starting to use the corridor and the newly planted corridor you can see here on the left area to cross to the Nimba reserve. So all of this was based on target plan concept, identifying best species and stock type to be able in a couple of years to see that such results are possible. And here on the, on the right pictures, you can see the fecal material of chimpanzees near the Nimba reserve which is which has been identified all over the corridor. So the corridor is being used by the chimpanzees. So this is one case study that I wanted to share. Another one comes from Morocco and it will be different from Dr. Youssef Benmir, the one that he will be um, um, he will be presenting in a bit. So in Morocco, we wanted to study the genetic adaptation of the Cedrus atlantica tree, which is symbolic in Morocco. Due to climate change, we have seen a decreasing population of that tree. And one of our major objectives was to study the genetic adaptation of those species. So we have developed an outplanting pilot based on that objective where 18 seed zones were identified. And depending on the different genetic characteristics of each seed zone, 
we wanted to study the potential of genetic differences among the eight stands from the reef, middle and upper atlas. I won't go into too much details now, but just to give you a small overview. So we have identified the seed sources, developed the nursery trial, including the nursery practices for the outplanting trial to be able to analyze our results and study the, gen gen the genetic adaptation of that species, um, including climate change effects. So this was just a quick design. And here again, our objective was just on a specific species. So the selection was just on one species, with, which was the Cedrus atlantica. So nursery practices were developed accordingly. The outplanting site was also developed, as you can see here. And genetic adaptation will be monitored. So we would be able to have a more um, accurate um, selection of seed zones and of plant material for future reforestation projects in Morocco. So I just wanted to outline the target plant concept uh, quickly with you now. And um, I'm sorry if anyone had any questions or hand raised uh, during the presentation. I was sharing my screen so I could not uh, see um, see anyone um, if they had any question. Um, but I will ask if people have question now or should we leave all the questions for the end of the webinar after uh, Dr. Youssef and Dr. Mohamed Nsour uh, both present their case studies. So maybe we will keep all the questions for the end. I will now give the floor to Dr. Uh, Yusuf Benmir. Dr. Yusuf Benmir is founder and president of the High Atlas Foundation, a Moroccan US not-for-profit organization dedicated to sustainable development. He is also currently a visiting professor of international studies at the University of Virginia. In Morocco, he was a Peace Corps volunteer between 93 and 95, Associate Peace Corps Director between 98 and 99, a researcher at the American Institute of Maghreb Studies in 2003, and a professor at El, uh, El Akhawan University at the School of Social Sciences and Humanities between 2009-2010. Dr. Ben Mir holds a PhD in sociology from the University of New Mexico um, in 2009, an MA in international development from Clark University in 97, and a BA in economics from New York University. He is the author of 140 articles on sustainable development in Morocco and the MENA region. So without any further wait, Dr. Yusuf Ben Mir, the floor is yours and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you to LRI and partners for bringing us together. I'm happy to turn on my video if you uh, may allow me. Um, I want to, uh, in these uh, few minutes, I want to describe a model that uh, if, is driven by the High Atlas Foundation, which is an organization that I'm grateful to be part of and lead, but it's really a Moroccan story. And it's what a Morocco as uh, it, in its public policies, in its enabling of civil society and so forth is enabling us to do. As we know, uh, projects that endure and have long life are community designed, uh, managed, controlled. They reflect their will, what, they, what the beneficiaries and participants want in their future. In rural Morocco, where 70% of agricultural land 
generates just 10 to 15 percent of revenue, 70 percent of land, <clears throat> 10 to 15 percent of revenue. That's because of the dependence on barley and corn. And in we are experiencing a major transition toward a fruit tree agriculture in this country. Uh, there are some billions of trees in demand that is part of this uh, movement toward much more lucrative uh, livelihood enhancing crop. Uh, Morocco is fortunate to have 14 varieties of fruit trees that grow organically and many subspecies within that. For example, there are 10 varieties of fig that are endemic to Morocco. There is an endemic uh, date in the northeast of the country. Uh, there is a harub carob and uh, apple and other fruit that is endemic to this nation. And in addition to that, there are dozens of wild medicinal plants. And so we're, the, the demand as in market forces in our world, the demand is increasing the price of fruit trees and making them uh, literally uh, unaffordable by a major swath of uh, rural communities. And so when we do community planning and we leave it open-ended, we may end up uh, supporting at the Hylas Foundation uh, clean drinking water or uh, bathrooms at schools. We have a major challenge in rural Morocco in that regard. So we support communities in the direction they wanna go, but because they are uh, facing this, 80% uh, of rural incomes come from agriculture, and they're facing pressures toward a transition, the demand for fruit trees is just uh, enormous. And um, the challenge we have is that when farmers rely on the barley and corn every year, farming families and communities can't give up their land to build tree nurseries. So we need the gift of land in order to enable this transition toward food security and better livelihoods and rural employability and these primary goals that farming communities have. We receive land uh, for community managed fruit tree nurseries from the Moroccan government, from the High Commission of Waters and Forests, from the Ministry of Education next to the schools. There are schools that, uh, many rural schools that have land that the young people don't play on or utilize that the ministry is giving to farming families to build their nurseries, the Ministry of Youth and Sports. We have uh, in Morocco, there are, uh, it's a multicultural, multi-faith uh, nation. We have uh, contributions of land from the Moroccan Christian community, from the Moroccan Jewish community. It's public and private and, and civil uh, sources of land so that farmers can build uh, their nursery. And that's key for us. The other thing is that, um, the seed selection, we, we don't have to instill appreciation for uh, native varieties. Uh, there is great uh, affection and demand for uh, the local crop. And what's essential in the nurseries that we help support is that the seeds are actually purchased from the farmers themselves. The, you know, less than 10 nations in the world grow almonds. The almond we buy from the growers of almond and, the, and those who's, who benefit from the nurseries. The cuttings of fig, the 15 centimeters that then go into nurseries, it's the farmers and the beneficiaries who go to their trees and provide the cuttings. Of course, skills building and how to do this is a integral part of, of this entire process. Um, I will say too that uh, right now as we manage uh, supporting cooperatives in their management of 15 nurseries in Morocco, around two and a half million seeds in nine different provinces. The target of these trees, these saplings, are uh, small landholders who may have a hectare or less. And so uh, their ability to accommodate large numbers of trees is just not there. So when this past season, when we transplanted 900,000 trees, for example, uh, that went to 4,000 farming families in 160 municipalities, um, which is key. I mean, we have to do that. But I will say what allows us to do much broader uh, reforestation and impact agroforestry 
is when we focus on collective lands. And that's where we are very much uh, today. As part of the COVID economic stimulus, Morocco is releasing uh, a million hectares to communities and the private sector. Uh, villages have lands that are now, that are traditionally used for grazing and they want to transition that to agroforestry and so forth. But the challenge in all of these cases and planting on collective lands is the bringing of water, the infrastructure of water, uh, the well, the solar pump, the containment systems, the adaptive management system, all of the, the data gathering to support all of that. And so that is the major cost that we run into. Uh, we are, we are, for example, in one area in the Eureka Valley, we're on a plateau, we're able to plant 45,000 primarily carob trees. Um, but it's the investment of $80,000 or, or, or that, al that allows us to do that in the water infrastructure. And what's critical about planting on collective lands is that every household has a share. Um, and in addition to that, the, what we've also observed is that there are, is a, uh, the farming communities that plant on collective lands are uh, from their own will and calculation, they are selling parts of their herd because they realize that the value of carob, in this case, the value of carob right now is $7 US a kilo in Morocco. A few years ago, is a, it was a dollar and a half a kilo. So commodity prices, not just carob is going up, up, up. They are making the calculation that uh, it, it's a better way to go uh, in this uh, uh, local seed variety of tree direction. And so they are reducing their herd size and we're seeing more regeneration of vegetation life as a result. Just two very quick points and I'll conclude there. You see the, our, our, our sort of vision moving forward. It always begins with participation. The association cooperative building is not just technical, but managerial. We work with cooperatives that aren't registered. They don't have a bank account, they have a financial management system, uh, a, a decision-making structure, statutes. Uh, all of these things need to be part and parcel of reforestation and building of nurseries. And again, it's the partnerships that allow us to do that. The USAID Farmer to Farmer program is critical for us for that expertise in both cooperative building and the technical aspects. Um, the we, LRI and the Highless Foundation share an enormous important partner, the US Forestry Service. Uh, they fund the YCC program and those young people are the monitors of trees and it's an employ employable skill. Uh, and that's where I wanna go with this model. The, the planting of trees in collective lands, on private lands, all of that has to be monitored. And when you, for us, that, and, and the building of an application WE4F, which is a consortium, they're hugely important to us in the technical aspects of building the application to monitor the trees. And our organizational growth and all the consulting they provide in that regard. Um, but I wanna say that that monitoring of trees and a consistent, rigorous, you know, the, the breast height, the diameter, the impact, the social, the environmental, the, the type of trees, all that criteria, all that data enables for the certification of carbon offset credits, which, which can be sold and enables the reinvestment, not just in more nurseries, but in those other priorities I described of, of waste management, of artisanal cooperatives, not just agricultural, uh, and those other uh, domains of human life that are hugely important, but they are uplifted by this model of a local seed, community managed nurseries that then are um, uh, transplanted to farming families, uh, monitored with the communities, with the growers, uh, and uh, that monitoring and certification allows for the com commercialization of carbon offset credits um, and I will finally say this, that we stand at a hugely special cusp in Morocco and, and of course elsewhere, we're not, we're not unique. What, what makes Morocco um, so positive is the fact that in everything I'm saying, uh, women's freedom and participation and all these different elements that go into it, multiculturalism, the encouragement of local seed and all, uh, participatory planning, decentralization, these are all Moroccan frameworks. 
And that allows us to talk about scale. And when we're talking about scale about in an area where fruit tree demands are in the billions and the price of a carbon offset credit is going up, up, up as, the, as we uh, ethically and by law are wanting to achieve and required to achieve carbon balance, we are at this cusp of major uh, demand uh, for both not but trees and offsets and driven and with us and with everyone hope we hope uh, driven by communities control and decision making and so we are we we're, we're just growing uh, and uh, again the the ability of, of, of what partners give to us is what makes this all possible and the reinvestment model is makes this into something that can be very very special inshallah for the nation. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Youssef. And this is interesting to hear the different, um, two, you have two different objectives, um, which is one social and economic. You are taking into consideration the ecological functions and the restoration of ecosystems as a whole to two different objectives, which is social integration of the communities, cultural and economic. So this is also just to see the, the diversity of um, objectives that are still in line in ecological restoration. It doesn't have to be that if you are, if you have an um, economic objective, that instantly it is not something um, ecologically friendly. Or, but this is the work of the High Atlas Foundation is very important to see where um, environment ecosystems meet social and economic at the same time. Um, th this is a different aspect of ecological restoration that is very interesting to see. And I know that a lot of people, they do have questions um, and uh, I will be answering every question um, at the end because we will have at least 15 minutes uh, for, for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Youssef, uh, for, for your presentation. Um, we will move. We did not have enough time or um, our speaker from Jordan today is Dr. Mohamed Nsour, the Natural Resources Manager for uh, from Wadi for Sustainable Ecosystem Development, NGO. Dr. Mohamed Nsour is a Natural Resource Manager at Wadi. Uh, for Sustainable Ecosystem Development. And before joining Wadi, he worked as a natural resource management for Sustainable Environment and Economic Development Project, SEED, implemented by the US Forest Service and funded by USAID. He is interested in effective restoration of degraded ecosystems in Jordan and native seedlings propagation techniques. Dr. Nsour has backgrounds in forestry and rangeland, plant biology, and environmental management. Um, Dr. Mohamed Nsour, the floor is yours. And would you like me to share the screen for your presentation, or will you be able to share it? Thank you, Karma. Thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation. I will be sharing the screen. And uh, if I have some technical issues, then I, I will revert to you. So basically, Thanks. I need your permission to, to share the screen, or you can yes. share them yourself. OK. Um, perfect. I think now you'll be able to share your screen. Thank you very much. So uh, let me just go. And I hope now you can see my screen. Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, so uh, once again, thanks for the invitation and this great opportunity to present some of uh, Wadi's work in, uh, in uh, ecological restoration. I will be speaking about the target plant concept and the dry land uh, restoration. 
uh, more specifically present by presenting a case study of Majdiya uh, village in Jordan. And uh, a quick uh, intro to our organization, Wadi is a Jordanian NGO that is working on ecological restoration by promoting uh, community uh, involvement and uh, science-based approaches. We are focusing on seedling propagation, restoration of degraded uh, rangelands, and uh, linking that with socioeconomic aspects. Uh, so I think most of the audience uh, are familiar with, uh, with the Jordan, which is uh, situated in, in the Near East. Uh, and Jordan, as uh, many of the countries in the region are among the dry land uh, area. Uh, so basically 30% of the globe uh, are mainly dominated by rangelands. Uh, which provide many economic and socio-economic benefits in dry lands, range lands is one of the main uh, land uses. And for that, it, it has uh, a very important role in supporting uh, vulnerable communities with agriculture and uh, land-based livelihoods. Uh, more or less, there are uh, now uh, more than 1 billion people around the globe suffering from, from land degradation. And our area is uh, specifically threatened by this, uh, by this hazard. Uh, for Jordan, uh, around 8% or more of the country is, uh, is composed of rangeland, which receives 200 milliliters of water or less. And most of rangeland areas are degraded. So the, the the objective or the ambition is uh, to improve land conditions and make it more productive to improve livelihoods of local inhabitants. So degradation is a process that happens all, all times. And uh, basically, uh, healthy rangeland areas produce a lot of services in terms of fodder, food and some regulatory services like climate regulation and uh, water management to improve the ground water recharge and many other services. With time, with harsh environmental conditions and human induced stresses, mainly grazing, the, these rangelands were degraded. Unfortunately, the rehabilitation uh, programs didn't, didn't uh, succeed in reverse the degradation status. So what we are hoping to do is moving from a state where uh, rehabilitation and restoration programs uh, uh, to improve the rehabilitation and uh, restoration programs from uh, not very successful thing to a more uh, success state. So returning the, the degraded rangeland into a transition state where they, they can produce more, uh, I would say, services and benefits for the, for the local community, but also for the environment in general. And then we come to the target plant concept, where seedlings uh, attribute are linked to out planting success. And by looking to the uh, target plant concept framework, uh, the, the, the framework uh, that uh, Karma has described earlier today is very useful to guide the planning, implementation, and improvement of restoration programs. By assessing situation, uh, identifying key challenges and key success steps. It's not all. It's not only focusing on the on the scientific science and technical aspects, but also links people together in nurseries and in restoration sites to uh, initiate a dialogue on what is needed to make uh, uh, restoration programs succeed. 
The whole process has a very strong monitoring and evaluation process to improve the learn to improve improve the learning process and subsequent improvement of activities, and mostly uh, depend on on local community support and involvement. So, uh, how we benefited from the target plan concept in Jordan? was by using the framework to analyze the Jordanian situation and what is what is needed to improve uh, the success in, in, in restoration programs of rangelands in Jordan. And basically, it, it is uh, similar to what Karma was describing before. We have issues with the plant. Initially, we, we, we observe issues with the planting material quality there is a need to improve restoration techniques and to involve uh, communities more in, in the whole process. By this, we have identified uh, short-term interventions that would lead us to uh, mid-term kind of goals and objectives. So basically, we started by uh, establishing uh, community nurseries in uh, in, in the targeted areas in Jordan. And we have uh, been able to establish some community nurseries that uh, depend on local communities uh, in, in areas of focus. So it is a very similar process to what Karma was uh, describing before. We have identified, assessed the locations to be targeted and identified native species suitable to uh, endure harsh environmental conditions, but also to bring some benefits and interest of the local communities. We have also emphasized the need for quality seedlings that is homogeneous and can be used in, in restoration programs. And by that, we didn't only uh, focus on the, on the appearance of the seedlings, but also on what, what make the seedlings survive in harsh environmental condition in dry land, which is the root system, and how this root system is able to support seedlings development and the growth in these, in these locations. Uh, by coming back to Majidiya, which is a small village located uh, to the east of the, of the capital, Amman, the site was, uh, was selected uh, based on an extensive selection criteria that make it uh, representative of Jordanian Badia. Uh, Badia is uh, a term that is used to, to describe uh, the, the Jordanian desert and include the, the livelihood of the area. Uh, so basically this, uh, the site was selected on, uh, on, uh, based on an extensive selection criteria from uh, biophysical and socioeconomic aspects, including soil, climate, uh, and uh, many other uh, aspects. And it's an area that has been used for uh, agro-pastoral uh, uses for long time. So the community used the area to, um, to plant, uh, basically to cultivate barley. But in recent years, the, uh, the, the area wasn't so productive. So uh, in the picture, uh, in the slide, if you see the dark area, this is the outflow of the, of the water where it can uh, where it's, uh, reside and uh, become more productive due to, to uh, to water outflow, and uh, the the black boundary is the intervention area, while the red boundary is the control. So part of the of the location, we have uh, a similar watershed interventions were uh, implemented in one part of the watershed, and the other was left as a control. Uh, in dry land, water is, is a very important aspect to drive uh, plant establishment and the growth. And for that, a mechanized micro water harvesting uh, system was used to create a water harvesting structures. The selection of the mechanized system was used for, uh, 
for uh, to test upscaling potential because these machines can actually prepare large areas uh, in in relatively short time and it can give uh, scientifically identical uh, shapes that can be used to to uh, build a good experience in water harvest the idea behind water harvesting is to collect as much water as possible to drive uh, plant growth and by uh, converting uh, harvested water into biomass that can be used for climate regulation but also for fodder food and other uh, environmental uh, or ecosystem services and uh, the site was established in 2016 and uh, till uh, 2020 and even uh, 2022 because we have more recent kind of uh, monitoring uh, of, of the site. You can see at your uh, uh, left hand side with these kind of hexagons, these are plots used to uh, monitor seedling survival while you can see at your uh, right hand side the control uh, watershed uh, till now we have something like 70 percent survival of planted seedlings and uh, this uh, this is uh, really nice because uh, uh, reportedly the rangeland rehabilitation in poland uh, didn't uh, give more than or in, 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 in average, we speak about 20% survival in previously planted projects, while we have uh, been uh, uh, able to increase this to around 70% of planted seedlings. The site, in addition to the surviving seedlings, uh, show uh, a good uh, natural regeneration that exceeds the number of uh, originally planted uh, seedlings. The, the, uh, let me say that the, there are many different ecosystem, uh, ecosystem services and benefits uh, that is produced from restoration projects. Mainly, they can be ecological and socioeconomic. Uh, they can uh, improve the condition at the at the short and midterm uh, aspects, but also on the long term, because if we look to the potential for uh, a groundwater recharge or for providing fodder or sequestering carbon, this not this is these aspects are not only important for the for the environment but also to improve livelihoods uh, in in target areas. One interesting thing in in dry lands is the growth patterns of trees and shrubs because uh, although trees might provide different or more benefits on the long run. And dry lands with their native shrubs are very important on the short run as they are very effective in stabilizing the land and sequestering carbon. For example, a small shrub uh, can reach up to more than one meter in size uh, in one or two years. Uh, the Majdiya site is very important because uh, it uh, gives us uh, information about how to intervene in agropastoral systems that is uh, covering uh, around 80% of Jordan's uh, landscape, how to provide benefits to the local community, but also about the approaches that need to be used in uh, restoring degraded uh, rangeland systems. Now we uh, uh, understand more the complexity of restoration process, starting by uh, site assessment, selecting sites, uh, identifying required species, uh, collecting the required planting material or collecting seeds, propagating seedlings, how to design the site and uh, uh, implement required site design and prepare it well, coming into planting and building a good monitoring evaluation and learning process uh, 
to understand more uh, what drives success or kill, cause failures, what can be challenging and how can we uh, respond to these challenges. Eventually, we are trying to uh, uh, move degraded and productive lands into lands that are productive and important for the local communities that produce more and uh, that can contribute to biodiversity, to climate regulation. And uh, in Jordan, even we have uh, an established pro uh, investigation showing that uh, restoration can help uh, in, in, in improving uh, Jordan's water security by increasing the amount uh, that would potentially recharge groundwater uh, in, in the groundwater aquifers. Um, uh, at the end, I want to uh, acknowledge the, the, the role of our uh, colleagues in the Inter International Center for Agriculture Research in Dryland, ICARDA, who had uh, contributed much to this effort. Basically, many of the information uh, presented came from, the, from ICARDA and for the generous grants uh, and the financial technical support from the United States the Forest Service and uh, for you all for listening. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, we would appreciate following us and contacting us in case uh, you have further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mohamed Sur, for an amazing presentation and also a great example of how the target plan concept has been used um, in, uh, in different contexts also. Thank you very much. Um, it's, I know we are, we have between 15 to 20 minutes and as promised, we have some questions we will be answering. Um, and also we would like, we would like you to share some, if you would like in future um, webinars to share some of your case studies, please do send us an email about it. And we would absolutely love to uh, hear about your case studies um, in the MENA region. Um, so I will let my colleague Khaldun from UNEP start uh, to help me read some of the questions in the Q&A box. Um, and meanwhile, also, I will be adding while we're answering questions. Also, I will be adding in the chat box a link for your feedback, um, a link for the feedback uh, of the webinar. Please take two minutes to fill it. And this will be useful for us to consider your feedback for future webinars. I will just be adding now in the uh, chat box. And Khaldun, um, if you could support me in reading some of the questions in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karma. I'd like to also thank the panelists for an amazing presentation. Now, before we begin with the questions, the next three questions are going to be in Arabic. So uh, to remind you, there is interpretation. So if you don't speak Arabic or you prefer listening to it in English, I'll give you a few seconds to switch channels. Okay, to start with the first question from uh, Bashir Mahmoudi. في كل الدول هناك مخابر بحث متخصصة في النباتات والأوساط المناسبة لزراعتها وهي مخابر تنتمي إلى الجامعات فهل هناك منصة بيانات يستفاد منها لإصلاح البيئة؟ لأن هذا يسهل العملية ويجعل النتائج مضمونة علميا وتقنيا بعيدا عن التكهنات والاحتمالات. Um, if Karma or any of the panelists would like to answer the question, please go ahead. Um, Dr. Yusuf, do you well, want to? Um, I just want to underscore the essential uh, aspect of that question. Um, universities are key for um, success to this. Um, they are a natural center for the coming together of data, civil data, community data, adaptive management data, public data, 
Um, and in part of, an important part of this is geographic information systems allowing for not just the, um, the management of this information, but um, assisting decision-making. Uh, and also, um, I will say this as well, the, the, in terms of the community component, how do we facilitate these meetings and planning? And oftentimes meetings begin without a sense of the future. You know, we've never been asked our vision before oftentimes. And so how are we supposed to be able to be part of participatory decision-making when, when, you know, when there's social controls in the room and all these kinds of things and within ourselves? And so students, universities are also not just the data gatherers and managers, uh, but also the facilitators of community dialogue, uh, the, uh, the, the future empowerment trainers. And so university partnerships are key for the technical, for the human, uh, for, the, for the expansion and all these different uh, essentials that we have toward restoration. May I uh, just uh, add to what Dr. Yusuf said? Like, uh, uh, unfortunately, in, in our region, I think we have a lot of uh, uh, conducted activities. Like, uh, there is a lot of efforts to propagate seedlings, to restore degraded land, and uh, uh, like, there is a lot of activities conducted. But uh, what what I believe is that we uh, still need more information about specific species. We don't find usually information about uh, growth forms and habits of specific species. Uh, if, for example, in, in nurseries, uh, what type of uh, uh, root system or speci specific requirements? And uh, like there is some inadequate level of information about locations to be restored, uh, their specific condition in the climate, soil, topography, these things. Even in seed management. Uh, so uh, I would say that there is a need to improve these kinds of, uh, of information, uh, which is a collective uh, kind of effort that everybody can help into. And, uh, Providing a platform to share, to share this information will be, will be a, a very great uh, a leap in, in restoration success in the future. Thank you. You know, I just want to add to what Professor Mohammed just said. The genetic um, analysis composition breakdown of argon, which is the argon tree, which is endemic to Morocco, um, is in France. If you can imagine, Morocco doesn't have that data. And there's a there, and that's not, not a unique situation. Morocco and nations need to have their own data and uh, in their control. And so in, investment in that regard in our universities and researchers and so forth um, is actually is, is essential to avoid this kind of uh, loss of our own natural identity. I will also just add um, to those amazing answers um, that yes, databases are very important and region databases are, are actually would be very, very helpful for us to continue in, in any restoration effort on the regional level. And um, we are really hoping that with the, a series of webinars and with all the collaborations we are doing and the networking we are doing, that maybe, maybe um, during this UN decade, we would be able to develop some kind of a platform where we can share all of um, all of the data and um, and start creating um, regional data sets um, that are made region here, like Dr. Yusuf just mentioned, um, and as Dr. Mohammed Sur also mentioned, um, we need to really think of what is the existing data that we have in, um, in this region and how will this be helpful for us in developing the best restoration projects 
Um, as you can see, the target plant concept, we require a lot of data about native species, their growth habit, genetic adaptation. Um, and this is sometimes not found or hard to find or not shareable. So um, again, we will highlight the importance of this and hoping that we can start working as a regional network on, on this issue. Thank you. Thank you everyone for such great answers. Okay, I'll be moving on to the second question, which is, هل تم اعداد خريطه نباتيه موائمه للخريطه الجغرافيه على المستوى الاقليمي والعالمي؟ So I, I can start by uh, by giving some some of my information in this regard. I would say that uh, there are some uh, ecological uh, maps that show plants uh, plant commu communities uh, in in the region. I think this has been developed uh, uh, for the globe. Uh, what is needed uh, like is more uh, national and local uh, detailed maps for each, uh, uh, for each country. The other thing that uh, might be relevant in this, uh, in, in this uh, regard is uh, it's, it's no longer enough to think in the future and in historical data and what is present because uh, with, with the climate change and the projected scenarios, we might need to revise not only the current maps, but also areas that will be suitable to be restored with certain uh, species. So the climate change has also impacted the, uh, the, the, the habitats that can be restored and gives more limitations in uh, what to select for which location and how to, uh, to conduct restoration. Like uh, rainfall, uh, rainfall average or uh, altitude, everything should be revised based not only current data, but also projected data. Otherwise we will have other challenges in the future. I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. Um, to um, move along to the third question from Abdullah al-Hindi, uh, Mr. Abdullah is asking, what is the mechanism of compensation for wild plants in arid and semi-arid regions, knowing that Yemen is yani has a third of its lands located within the arid and semi-arid areas? You know, I'll just reflect a moment on that question in our experience in Morocco, and perhaps it's useful. Um, the, in, in the region of the Oriental, the Oujda region, northeast of Morocco, uh, I believe the largest land space region of, of the 12 in, in this country, we worked with 80 cooperatives, the majority of them dedicated to the gathering and uh, drying of wild medicinal plants. On the one hand, the government has been, these, these plants are on public domain. And so it requires a relationship, a partnership with the High Commission of Water and Forests. And on the one hand, the, it's been productive in that way. It's been positive. On the other hand, uh, only two out of the 80 of those cooperatives have certification in that handling of the product, certification so that they can sell beyond the local sook. How do, how, how do gatherers, growers, dryers, processors of wild medicinal plants, which are in huge global demand, but yet they can't reach a market beyond the, the most immediate one without certification in how they manage the product ultimately to, to a, a market that pays better and so what we need to focus on in our case is the capacity building aspect. The, 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 the bounty the, the, is there, but it's the, it's the, uh, the, the training, the, the material, the infrastructure, the, uh, the, the planning, all of those skills enabled, that really enables the, the value to be attained by the gatherers, the growers, and so forth, 
that's what's essential in our case. And uh, it's very few who have the uh, certification and therefore the ability to have a real sustainable initiative. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. Would anyone else like to add to this contribution or should we move on to the next question? Um, maybe for the sake of time also, because we have um, just five minutes left, we can answer a couple more questions. And um, maybe uh, I, I see that Salem uh, Boussais has his hand raised uh, since a while, so if he has a question. So maybe we can answer one more question from the Q&A and, um, and then, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Karma. Okay, so we'll move on to Mr. Ala Al Hashim. Uh, Mr. Ala is asking if marine ecosystems are considered in land degradation restoration. Yes, I will uh, jump to this. Definitely, um, they are considered. Um, any ecosystem is, should be considered in, um, for restoration. Um, and yes, limited marine ecosystems, um, as in surface area, I believe exist in the MENA region, but this is definitely considered also. And this requires other sets of expertise also in research and um, and degrees. So um, working with the right stakeholders, with the right practitioners, with the right people for marine ecosystem restoration is also very important as it is quite different from terrestrial restoration, um, but definitely is included. Thank you very much, Karma. Um, now we can give the floor to um, people who have raised their hands. Um, I can see one, Salem Vusais. Um, I think. You can, can you unmute now, Mr. Hello? Hello? You hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karma and your uh, colleagues. Yeah, but uh, I, I want to uh, express my question in Arabic because... Uh, okay. Yes, so, please uh, do. بالنسبة uh, لموضوع target plan, هذا الموضوع بصراحة مهم جدا ويعني بالنسبة لي يعني يعتبر كمصطلح جديد وجميل لتحديد ما هي متطلبات كل منطقة من أجل المكافحة التغير المناخي لكن بصراحة يعني تحديد الأصناف أو يعني تحديد صرف معين لتعميمه على مناطق على على مناطق أو رينج واسع من الـ من الإيكو سيستمز هذا بيخلي الفرايتي للأليلز يكون يكون قليل جدا وبالتالي تتعرض ممكن تتعرض هذه هذا الصنف إلى نكسات نتيجة نتيجة تغير مناخي نتيجة عدم اهتمام تقصير البشر إلى آخره فأظن تحديد التارجت تارجت بلان لابد أن يخضع كل منطقة صغيرة كل سمول هابيتات يعني المايكرو هابيتات يكون محدد له ما هو النبات اللي اللي يصلح له فقط أما أما أن تكون تجربة عامة وكبيرة وشاملة إلى رينج واسع من من المنطقة الجغرافية أنا أظن أن هذا الموضوع يحتاج بحث أكبر وعدم استعجال فيه هذا بصراحة يعني اللي جاء في بالي أثناء هذا أثناء هذا العرض لكني أشكركم جدا على هذا ال على هذا الموضوع صراحة موضوع مثير للاهتمام إلى أقصى درجة شكرا زيان. Thank you very much. هذا موضوع كتير مهم. And I'm sorry if I will switch back to English بين العربي والإنجليش رح جرب. Um, this is a very uh, important comment that you have just made, uh, Mr. Salem. Um, and yes, when we Consider the target plant concept, it's for a diverse number of species and not only limited to a specific um, area. We start definitely with, um, with a pilot to see um, 
what to to identify the best practices. Um, however, in in a lot of our cases um, and our projects, we did not just include one or two specific species. It can be um, customized and implemented for a diverse number of species within the same area, within the same project area. And um, in some of the cases in Lebanon, we have tried uh, on larger surface areas. Um, and this is where the planning is very important. I think in the, in the presentation, in one of the slides, I have shown the, um, the uh, time to, to be able to plan such um, projects, especially if it's a larger scale project and that involves diverse number of species. Um, it requires up to two years to be able to plan this right and to be able to have successful results um, on site. So yes, the target plan concept is made in a way that you can use on small sites, larger scale sites, and um, also taking into consideration the biodiversity and diversity of uh, species in certain, in certain sites. Um, in the region, it hasn't been implemented too much. And yes, uh, we do acknowledge that this would, needs to be tried and implemented in every project. Um, um, I will, and Dr. Mohammed Nsour can talk more about this, but in, in Jordan, we started with a very small site, but then also shifted to larger sites with similar um, results, um, with, with similar results. Uh, so yes, um, and we are hoping that this kind of, um, these kinds of practices can be and more and more disseminated throughout the region and um, tried also. So I hope this kind of answers your worries or your answers for this, but thank you very much. And yes, it is something to consider a lot. Um, so I think it is exactly 12.30 and I hope everyone got the link for your for, 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 to include your feedback on the webinar because it will help us also in um, future webinars to improve them. Um, so and if anyone also um, thought that we left some answers on um, some questions unanswered, sorry please feel free to email us and send us also your questions. We will be more than happy to answer them um, through emails. Um, I would again like to thank Dr. Yusuf Ben-Mir and Dr. Mohamed Nsour for joining us today and for sharing the amazing, amazing work um, they have been doing. And hopefully everyone will also be able to join us for our next webinar that should be next month also. And you will definitely be receiving an email regarding this. Um, Khaldun, would you like to share anything else also? Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Kalma. I just wanted to see if it's possible to take a picture with the panelists. So if we could all open our video cameras. If that's okay with everyone. <laughs> um, I'm not able to open mine. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah I, I can open mine, it's just not allowing me. <laughs> okay, um, maybe maybe we can Photoshop this after. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to turn on my camera, but it's just not allowing me. Um, yeah, I'm trying. If it's, if it's, it's too uh, oh. technical. It's we fine. have a problem on the open the camera. Where is it? Yeah, it's um. I think it's a bit complicated here also. 
كارما نيفر مايند ات واز جاست فور اوكي لا تعمل لا لا تعمل وي ويل تيك ذات انتو كونسيدريشن فور نيكست ويبينار اولسو اند وي ويل بي فوتوشوبينج افري ون اند هوبفلي ثانك يو فيري ماتش ثانك يو من ضمن الريكومنديشن Yeah, this is from the recommendations. Work on this. <laughs> But thank you for all the attendees and all the panelists. And uh, hopefully you have a great uh, day and rest of the week. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carmen. Thank, uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, thanks.